Hello, Fulbright awardees who are going to Eurasia. My name is Carol Silverman, and I'm a professor of folklore and cultural anthropology at the University of Oregon, and we're delighted to be able to present to you some Balkan folk music. Uh, I am a member of a band called Slave, which means nightingale, and we've prepared a virtual performance and a kind of lecture demo for you to acquaint you with music from southeastern Europe, that's the Balkans, uh, because they are a very, very rich collection of songs, music, dances, and cultural celebrations that you will likely be exposed to in your travels. In the entire region of Eurasia, music is really important. Young people, old people, every generation of people are interested in music, and folk music really informs even popular forms of music today. But older forms of folk music still exist in wedding celebrations, in other life cycle celebrations, in calendrical celebrations such as Saints Days for Eastern Orthodox people and the end of Ramadan for Muslim people. So in general, music is interwoven in life today in Eurasia and especially in the Balkans. Now, we are focusing on the Balkans because it's a really interesting area for the combination of Eastern and Western influences. From the East, we have Ottoman influences because the whole area of Southeastern Europe was ruled by the Ottoman Turks for 500 years. And we have melismatic melodies that have a lot of ornamentation, one syllable being sung on many notes. We have modal scales that are different from Western scales. And we have additive rhythms that are in combinations of threes and twos, such as three, two, two, which could be clapped one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, adding up to seven. You'll hear quite a bit of that in our music. We also have influences from the West, lots of harmonies in thirds and in fifths, and instruments from the West that you'll see us playing, clarinet, accordion, trumpet, but also instruments from the Balkans and further east, such as a two-headed drum called a davul or tapan that you'll see in our ensemble. I'd like to introduce you to the members of our ensemble. We are all Americans who have learned Balkan music through either studying abroad or listening very careful to recordings. And um, my husband, Mark Levy, is playing clarinet. He is a retired professor of ethnomusicology from the University of Oregon. And he also founded the East European Folklife Center. Should you be interested in learning any of this kind of music, there are many places in America where you can actually go to camps and seminars and learn the music the dance, and the singing. And many of those are sponsored by the EEFC, East European Folklife Center, which he founded. You can find that online. Uh, one of Mark's students is Cody Simmons, who was in Mark Levy's band at the University of Oregon and established his own brass band here in Eugene, and he's playing trumpet with us. And then we have our two colleagues in Seattle, David Belitis, who is of Greek American origin and is playing the tapan, the two-headed drum, and is equally proficient in a number of instruments. I'll talk about those later. For us, he's playing drum. And our last member is Michael Lawson, a uh, accordionist extraordinaire, and he will also be singing for you. So he's an excellent vocalist. Now, you're going to be seeing instruments that are Western instruments, except for the tapan, the two-headed drum, but there are also village instruments in the Balkans that we, you'll, you won't see that are still being played today, things like a vertically held uh, fiddle and a... Um, uh, a, a flute instrument, and many others. But our band in this version will be playing more in the modern style of Balkan music. However, when I introduce the song text, you'll 
be struck immediately that there's a lot of references to rural village life of 50, 100 years ago. And through the songs, you can actually learn a lot about village and traditional culture. So there are gender relationships to unpack. There are male and female age differences. There are expected roles for the elderly and the children. And another important thing is the relationship of agriculture and the herding of animals to the economy. Because before the 20th century and urbanization, the entire region was agricultural and had a herding economy for goats and sheep. So all of that is reflected in the song text. So as we go through our songs, I'll be introducing each one. We want you to enjoy the music. We also want you to learn something. And when you're in the region during your Fulbright, you will probably go to a wedding or a baptism for a Christian family or a celebration of a circumcision for a Muslim family, and you might be pulled into the dance line. So all of this music we're doing will be dance music, and we encourage you to explore it on your own as well. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Carol Silverman, and we'd like to present to you a wedding song from Bulgaria, from the southern province of Thrace. And this is an interesting song, first of all, because of its context. Uh, weddings in Bulgaria tend to be really big with a lot of relatives and friends, and sometimes they're outside on the street, and they bring the community together and they bring the family together. And music and dancing go on for hours and hours. So this song would be sung in a series of songs, uh, usually they're a professional band and a wedding singer or two or three, and people often know the words and make requests. So people are very involved in their folk music. Now this song offers the opportunity to kind of uh, interpret Bulgarian history plus a love story. The song refers to the Ottoman period, actually the period of rebellion against the Ottomans. Bulgaria was ruled by the Ottomans for 500 years, like most of the southern Balkans, and there were rebel battalions that were gathered in the mountains to fight off the Turks to inspire independence, okay? And many of these were young men who were very, very brave. So the song starts out actually as a kind of uh, tension between a battalion leader and his desire to see his girlfriend. So he's in the mountains and he's saying, because of you, her name is Grozdana, because of you, Grozdana, I left the Stara Planina, that's the name of a mountain, in Thrace, with 70 of my men, my heroes, and even seven more. They were all very faithful. And I left because of you, because if you would only turn around once and lift your veil, I would see your face to see if you are fair, if your eyes are dark, and to see if they suit me. Now she answers him in metaphors, which is very common in Bulgarian music, where a woman's eyes are compared to something in nature or her mouth. In this case, my face is like a carnation, she says. My eyes are like cherries. My eyebrows are like braids. And those braids actually refer to the kind of woolen braiding that appears on the costume of the region. But, she says, even if you, you're suited to me, I'm already engaged to somebody else. My mother engaged me, and she even exchanged rings. Now, this, of course, refers to arranged marriages, which were very common in the Balkans and in other traditional societies 50, 100 years ago, and even today in some uh, ethnic groups of the region. And usually, 
the songs depict something either horrible or wonderful. So you hear the worst thing about arranged marriages or the best thing about how you outsmarted them and got to marry your boyfriend from when you were five years old who lives next door. In this case, my mother exchanged rings and never even asked me. She engaged me to a handsome boy. He was very handsome, but he's not in my heart. So the implication is that she would like to marry this battalion leader, but because of respect for the elderly, she has to go along with her parents' wishes. Zaradi Tebe Grozdana. Thank you. 